New images emerge as all leaks point to Overwatch 2 being announced at BlizzCon 2019. Microsoft's financial report reveals a rough quarter for Xbox. Death Stranding is coming to PC in 2020, but there are fears over Epic and Ubisoft eventually intend to fix Ghost Recon Breakpoint, and a special bit of breaking news as EA is coming to Steam. All of that and more on today's episode of The Roundup. Hey everyone and welcome back to another edition of The Roundup. As always, be sure to like, subscribe and ring that bell to let the YouTube algorithm know that you're enjoying the content. And with that, let's get into the news. We're going to kick off today's affairs with a major breaking story. EA are partnering with Valve to bring their library over to Steam. Now this kicks off with Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, but it will soon see other titles come to Steam, as well as their Origin Access subscription service. It's not all golden though, you're still going to need an Origin account to actually, you you know, like play the games, so uh, it'll be a bit more like how it is if you use a like a Ubisoft game through Steam. Not ideal, but it is a bit more choice for consumers, and that overall is a good thing. Now, EA will likely want to expand their player base here, given the underperformance of Battlefield 5 and Anthem, so I think this move makes good sense for them. As for Valve, well, to be honest, I imagine they just want as many users on their platform as they can get, and that just means having as much game availability as is possible. EA's games are pretty major hitters, and uh, them being on Steam is in line with that. I think that's especially the case as well in a world where Epic are attempting to snap up those big heavy hitter exclusives, so it certainly does seem like a good move for them. Then of course, I think it's also interesting that EA would choose to eat the 20% rev share above $50 million revenue. Of course, that's 25% above 10 million, 30% below that. Maybe they've got some sort of special agreement worked out with Valve, or they've just crunched the numbers and found that the expanded audience that they'll get from Steam is actually worth it. I've also got to imagine that bringing Origin Access to Steam is another major factor for them, one that will no doubt give it more exposure and have uh, just better performance for it, and also give Valve a Game Pass competitor on their platform. Of course, as we've covered, they do seem to, uh, seem to be in decent terms with Microsoft, but it certainly would make the Steam offering a bit more robust. So overall, I'll say it is a pity that you still will need like an Origin client. Hopefully they make like a pared down light version of the Origin client that's just used for DRM and launching games. So that bit's kind of unfortunate, but overall, a bit more choice for consumers is good, and I know a lot of people will want those titles, but on their Steam library, and at least they'll get that with this. Next up, BlizzCon is only a few days away, and if leaks are to be believed, a formal announcement of Overwatch 2 is imminent. Of course, I already covered Diablo 4 last week on the channel. Now, formal reveal aside, we actually seem to know quite a bit about Overwatch 2 going into BlizzCon, with Slasher providing a handy compilation of the key elements for ESPN Esports. So, According to a BlizzCon source and a BlizzCon training document, which was obtained by ESPN, the game is officially called Overwatch 2, and it is going to have a substantial PvE component, which, I mean, doesn't surprise anyone. Now, one of the missions allegedly will be a four-player story experience set in Rio, which presumably is why there's an updated look for Lucio that's also been leaked alongside with the game's new logo. Now, in terms of features, well, hero talents and items are coming to Overwatch 2's PvE mode, which, again, seems pretty decent. A leaked image of a skill menu for Tracer also hints at a new leveling mechanic and equipable abilities. Overall, I think that would be a solid addition for the PvE mode that would probably give it a bit more replayability. Then the ESPN article also speculates that the game is going to feature at least one new hero, and this is a claim that is backed up somewhat by the leaked images that we've since seen. So on those images, well, there is a sort of profile shot, and then what also looks like a screenshot from a campaign cutscene, and it appears to show a character called Sojourn that uh, Blizzard have teased in the past, so that'll probably excite the Overwatch people. Now, something that is still somewhat up in the air is how exactly Overwatch 2 is going to integrate with the original game that, you know, many people already own. Now, one possibility is that it's going to act as somewhat of a PvE-based expansion for the base game, and that's an idea that is backed up somewhat by the ESPN article. Now, if the leaks are accurate, uh, Slasher revealed that vanilla Overwatch is also going to be getting its first new mode, and this is uh, Taxi First new one since the game entered beta in 2015. Now this mode is going to be called Push and it's going to be set to be unveiled alongside a new map that is in Toronto. ESPN also say that this new mode as well as the new PvE mode are predicted to be playable at BlizzCon over the weekend, which again isn't really a surprise. Now one last leak actually comes courtesy of Blizz. This is kind of funny. So the Blizzard store of all places leaked art for Overwatch 2. Now this artwork features a character called Echo and that's a character that Jeff Kaplan confirmed would eventually be 
be a hero. So overall, I'd say this. Dedicated story experiences are clearly something that the Overwatch players have been wanting for years. And while these are, of course, still leaks at this point, I think the Overwatch fans can, you know, they can be forgiven for uh, being a bit hopeful of a more rounded story experience for the game. Certainly, it's been pretty fragmented, and I mean, it hasn't really been a story, it's just been fragments of world building, so it'll be interesting to see how Blizzard tackle that challenge. Now, as another aside, over on the World of Warcraft front, it seems like their most recent expansion has also been leaked via the store, and if you're really interested in the WoW stuff, I've actually got a video on that over on our WoW channel, so you can check that out. And then next up, we're entering the financial results season yet again, and Microsoft have released their most recent quarterly report. Now, the report reveals a pretty strong performance for Microsoft's Intelligent Cloud Services division, detailing a 27% growth in revenue against the same period last year, so that's pretty good. The Xbox, meanwhile, has seen, uh, well, a much more modest performance, to put it lightly. Xbox saw an increase in revenue of just 1%. Now, Xbox's small revenue growth is normal enough, right? That can be attributed to many different factors. So with Project Scarlet on the horizon in holiday 2020 and the Xbox One, I mean, really ending its or nearing the end of its life cycle, I mean, it makes sense that hardware sales are going to be very slow. Uh, a comparatively strong quarter last year is also highlighted in the report as uh, this year's strength in Minecraft and subscriptions have effectively been offset. Now, Microsoft also did report a 7% decrease in their gaming revenue, which uh, you might seem as, you know, think is uh, shocking, but I mean, presumably that's just a result of slowing console sales and the generation wrapping up. Now, Xbox growth is actually holding relatively steady, and that's most likely because of the continued growth of Xbox Game Pass subscriptions. The slightly frustrating thing about the reports is that uh, it's hard to get exact numbers and things. Microsoft haven't given us like exact user figures for the Xbox performance, but their CEO Satya Nadella did note that this quarter saw record-breaking numbers for Xbox Live monthly active users, and that is bound to be one of the most important benchmarks for the company. So I think to me, it's clear that these recent declines are cyclical and that Microsoft's Game Pass push is primarily intended to grow their user base, you know, to really like sow or like to sort of grow like fertile soil and, you know, sow the seeds so that when Scarlet comes around, they've got loads of people who, you know, they're, they're already on Games Pass. They're in this like positive Microsoft ecosystem where they're playing loads of new games. They have like their gaming time increasing. So that's like a pretty good place for them to be like, you know, putting out their new consoles. And I think overall, that's what their big strategy is. And to be honest, it seems like it's working because it does seem like Game Pass is providing people with uh, a pretty darn good value and user experience. Then next up, we've got Ubisoft. So to put it lightly, right, Ghost Recon Breakpoint just bombed for them. Now, as we reported in our video last week, the game's poor reception prompted a recalibration of Ubisoft's projections for the upcoming financial year, a really significant one at that, as well as the delay of several future releases. It was a pretty darn big shakeup. So their CEO last week stated that they're going Going to continue to support Breakpoint in spite of the rough start and that the team is going to be making improvements to the game based on the community feedback. And uh, I mean, that's the right thing to do. They shouldn't just cut and run. Now, this week, they have actually offered some details on how they're going to try to fix Breakpoint. So an update on the official Breakpoint website outlines a sort of five-point plan for reinvigorating the game and making it a little bit better. It highlights improving the technical state of the game, which, uh, yeah, they really needed. It had some big issues, so that's their first priority, and they revealed several uh, patches that are going, uh, going to be released throughout November that are aiming to smoothen up the experience. The post also outlines plans for post-launch content as a sort of demonstration of Ubisoft's commitment to supporting the game in the long term. So Project Titan, the game's first ever raid, is going to be releasing in December, and it's going to be followed up by the Terminator Live event. Now, tellingly, perhaps the most significant source of backlash for Breakpoint is uh, also received receiving the smallest write-up in Ubisoft's blog post, and I think it's pretty clear why, because it's on the subject of their economy. So Ubisoft offer really little beyond confirming that they've heard people's criticism and are currently uh, working to make adjustments to the in-game economy according to players. What that'll actually be, it's hard to know because, uh, I mean, the economy is how they make their money. Now, AI teammates were also an announcement uh, at E3, and the team have confirmed that they're still on their way, but that the implementation is a pretty major undertaking that's still 
still will require a lot of time, which I mean is odd considering like it was a thing in the last game. But anyway, and additionally, the team were also dedicated to immersing fans in a gritty and authentic military experience according to it, and that they've got several updates uh, in the works for that. So the team are working towards enabling uh, full player freedom of choice, uh, whatever that might mean, and more ways to cater or to uh, make Breakpoint basically cater to them personally. That all sounds great, but they said it's too early to reveal what they're actually working on there. Uh, but like news is coming in the future, so it's a bit weird there. Now the post does wrap up by emphasizing that the team have a lot of work ahead of them, and I mean, yeah, they certainly do. And uh, they requested just patience from their players. Overall, it kind of makes sense. The team said the player feedback has been invaluable to them, and they also announced that they're introducing a community survey to better gather feedback and to ensure that they are tackling the right topics at the right time. So clearly something is happening there behind the scenes. I think that is a good thing, but it does remain to be seen whether their Ghost Recon Breakpoint can actually be saved. I mean, as I just said with all that player freedom of choice and catering the experience, we still don't know what that actually means. Anyway, it's good to see that they're sticking with it. I mean, it's not exactly new ground for an Ubisoft title. They did stick with the Division 1 and greatly improved it by the time patch 1.8 rolled around. And Rainbow Six Siege, I mean, if they did not heavily work on that at the very beginning, the game would have been dead in the water. But they actually put in the work and it really did pay dividends. Then finally, a quickfire story about Death Stranding on PC. See, we've got some uh, good news as Hideo Kojima this week has announced that Death Stranding is going to be heading to the PC platform in 2020. Well, in early summer of 2020, so it still is quite a bit off. Now, it's notable here that Sony are publishing Death Stranding and that the game was announced as a PS4 console exclusive console exclusive, so yeah, it's on PC. Now, 505 Games are publishing the PC version and they have yet to comment on which marketplace it will be going on. This has, of course, sparked worries of, of course, Epic Games, as 505's recent title, Control, was an Epic exclusive. Now, from my view, Death Stranding seems like the ideal exclusive from Epic's point of view, as that's a game that already has a well-built, passionate fan base, and therefore, I would assume, would have a higher conversion rate over to their store. Of course, that's not one that'll make fans happy. Now, I suppose it's also interesting, as Sony's big games typically do just stay on the PS4, but uh, Death Stranding's move to PC may represent a sort of thaw in that attitude, because other popular Sony exclusive titles such as Journey and Detroit Become Human have uh, actually made the move in the past. So this could be a more conscious move to bring more exclusive IP to the PC from Sony. But anyway, that's it for today's episode of The Roundup. There's not much in terms of new releases. Over on the Switch, they do have a new um, Luigi's Mansion and Harvest Moon coming out. So I guess that's uh, pretty cool for the people who are into those games. Certainly, I remember playing Harvest Moon Friends of Mineral Town on my Game Boy Advance back in the day. Anyway, that's it for me. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And with that, I will see you next time.